Starting recording. Welcome everybody. August 23rd meeting development team. Primarily topics for today are CNC torch table as well as the uh, power cube. Uh, the power cube slash brick press workshop is this week. So that's uh, some of the things we are finishing up. Uh, first thing is welcome to some new developers here. And let me share the working doc here if you don't have that. And please paste any of your results if you have any into there. Can everybody hear me or is the is the connection decent? If you can type in. That's the working document. Um, yeah, can you guys hear me? If you can type into the, the doc, make sure everything is okay. And then I'll share my screen. Okay, sounds good. And we've got Jose, Roberto, Abe. We only appear to have three people at present. I'll continue anyway. Okay, uh, sharing the screen. Sharing, okay. Um, let's uh, get going here. So just an update on the recent velocity. We're, we're continuing uh, time time hours are pretty good we're about 10 people contributing per week and, and about 23 uh, 230 hours so about uh, if a if a work week is 40 hours Wow 23 is like five full-time five six full-time equivalent six times 40 for a 40 hour week that's 240 we're about 240 here so not too bad, <laughs> you can say um, about six six person equivalent. That's good. We've got a new person or two on a team. So so German or Hermann, I don't know how you say that, from Australia is joining the team on, on development. And um, we're going to assign some tasks. Also Salam joined us from Saudi Arabia. Uh, I believe it's Saudi Arabia. It's from the Mid East team. Uh, we've got him joining on a team. He's he's a, he's a skilled in robotics, so possibly we can get the the autonomous tractor going. Um, this workshop. So let's take a look at uh, just the roadmap. I totally slashed and burned through this roadmap here to make updates. So main thing was uh, so we had the 3D printer workshop that was good. Uh, built a bunch of printers. Got some started on some of the PVC frames like like this big one up to the two foot big one but actually when we took take a look at the critical path I mean right now uh, we don't have anyone here continuing that development the point on the workshops if you want to talk about a stable workshop we're gonna do another one on the 30th of September which is 3d printer filament maker workshop uh, Emmanuel wasn't ready for it at at in uh, we talked about that he basically wants to do a wooden framed version. I don't know if he still wants to do that, but uh, he's in, in, interested in making some developments which would delay possible workshop there. So we want to hold a small one or, or a decent workshop here again just to continue the momentum on the workshops. We definitely found a few missing links in the, the last build on a 3D printer. Um, if we talk about the workshops here on this page, um, the several issues like like an issue on just just minor improvements but minor that minor and critical like one thing we found out for example the the extruders with the long neck where we have that long ex, uh, sensor holder that just doesn't hold up like and I just didn't notice that until now like I had a I had several printers running of course I had up to five printers running for printing parts but it didn't really fail until like recently that that, that I noticed it uh, we have to go either to redesigning the mount for the sensor on the long ex long neck extruder meaning where the that extruder neck where where the uh, nozzle is attached to some some of the extruders have that as a long one some of it have very short in which case we use the short or long sensor mount the short mount really works well the other one just doesn't so that needs to be fixed and i think um we've had enough issues on uh, and people, of course, have pointed this out that a one-sided Z support is going to get you the platform. To, platform might tilt over time, and it does. Like over time, you have to recalibrate it if it tilts. So I think a better idea is to do two Z axes on the on the Z axis. So that's uh, actually an important point because uh, in the print cluster, I had uh, 
six printers made. I had at most five running at a time. It was just enough trouble, like, you know, had to fix a thing here or there that it wasn't uh, really suitable. So at this point, I'm like, okay, let's get the pr print cluster mastered. Let's get that really resilient. So once you set it up, you never, ever have to touch because the, what what it turns out is once you have so many printers to deal with, it's like any little thing that that you have to mess with will take up your time. It's just not feasible. The, the machine has to be, you, you set it up, you let it go, it stays there for like a year without you having to touch it. Otherwise, you're messing with it constantly. So really got to get that, uh, that quality control up. So yeah, double Z axis, improved sensor holder for the long, long uh, neck extruders. But the extruders aren't really great. They get stuck. I mean, they're good entry level, but they get stuck. Sometimes they're hard to clean out if they do get stuck. We, w we definitely want to go to the Lowell's Bot Mini Extruder as a next step, next major improvement. And then also one of the other things that happened that's a, that's catastrophic or, or just not acceptable is the ramps boards burning out after like 500 hours of operation, like just about every one of those. Um, the heat bed has like uh, 10 amps, 12 amps or so. The ramps board can't handle that that so well without burning out the connector actually after some time and I've had now I think three or four printers do that so what what we're doing right now is putting an external uh, bed activator external bed relay that we're using now on I've got that installed on three printers but that will avoid any of the boards burning out so you can you can put whatever size of a huge bed you like and it was burning out with the 8 inch bed so if you want to go to 12 inch or 24 inch it definitely absolutely can't handle that so the external relay for the bed activation bed heating activation which is 10 or 20 amps or so going through it and we're gonna to go to AC on that just to do, do nichrome for the bigger beds um, the uh, off-the-shelf heat beds get very expensive or you can't get something that's 2 by 2 feet so we'll have to make that out of nichrome and, and uh, and uh, electrical insulation for nichrome wire so we'll do that later but yeah definitely a few few little uh, bugs to work out to to make the the print cluster actually absolutely perfect and make make the results better so that's that's definitely up for next time uh, we'll make some of these fixes so that's on the workshops continuing on the workshops though we've got the power cube coming up this week power cube brick press and it's pretty good uh, I'll talk more about that now, more the longer term, the CNC torch table workshop. Hey, we didn't really do that great on the torch table and over two weeks that Emmanuel was here. We didn't get far. We got like x-axis working up to y-axis, but turn out one of the main challenges was that the y-axis, because it's 12 foot long, I mean, those, those shafts were very heavy, so they end up distorting the structure. And not like we can't do it, but it, it's taking longer and uh, we're gonna have to return back to that. I think the design product uh, practice, design pattern of the universal axis still is absolutely sound, but we just have to have beefy metal sandwiches around those pieces so that nothing warps. And we did get motion on the 12 feet, but also probably as the next step there, we wanna go probably to 12 millimeter belts. I mean, the six millimeter belts worked, but then at some point they would skip. So not enough traction. Basically, the motors were very powerful, actually. Not, not a problem with the stepper motors. They're actually fine for driving the, the, the torch axes, but they start to slip. So that's what we've observed. So a solution there is go to bigger belts. You can also go to bigger pulleys, so more of the pulley is engaged. So those two things will definitely want to be done for the torch table. But it's kind of like almost back to the drawing board on some of the design while... I mean, everything still stands. The promise is there. We just haven't gotten as far as we like. So we can say we're like two weeks behind on that. And I'm thinking a good thing to do is, I mean, that's a very critical, important tool, definitely important for the tractor, uh, cutting the tractor or the brick press or anything, like the, the frames for the 3D printer, anything. Um, but I'm thinking right now uh, it would be good to do a workshop on that. So we can plan on, I'm going to put this on a calendar as a tentative here, and we'll see how we do over the next two weeks as we redesign the CNC torch uh, here but CNC torch table workshop where we basically demonstrate run and cut and and educate people about the torch table how it's designed and built and we we probably would build parts of a next one or like uh, possibly based on the existing torch table we can have like one 
one or two builds that people actually get to take home which would be very cool but that's pending us getting excellent results on, a, on an existing torch table which i don't see issues with how that would not happen uh, pending just being careful about all the different aspects about it but torch table workshop tentatively for october but we absolutely need that before the tractor so if the tractor was supposed to be on october 15 i think we got to move the tractor like two weeks and do the torch table first so do the tractor workshop uh, October 30 so as, as you see we're pushing stuff back and back but you know things don't go always as planned uh, definitely but we just got to keep going at it until we we do things but on a positive note I think um, progress on the printer and brick press power cube it's all good I think we're getting major simplifications especially on a I'm gonna talk about the brick press right now so here you see the controller and slide number six this is what we've developed last year it's a very simple controller it's got our OSC controller board pretty simple just a few wires and some MOSFET drivers for the solenoids um, and the box itself you can do it auto mode where you have automated pressing or up down left right for manual controls very simple you can see that I think you can understand that interface turn on the power switch from auto to manual mode and then in manual mode drive the brick press by moving the cylinders up and down left and right etc that's that's the manual control or otherwise on automatic the brick just spits out your x bricks per minute um, automatically and i actually reviewed the code from 2010 and what i noticed is that when we got to the auto mode so this is an important point just for everyone um, right now the auto mode runs on a controller the manual mode while it looks like it's connected to the controller here it is absolutely not it it's absolutely non not in the code anymore so we just do these buttons but it's not in the control code so we're separating the two because you don't need the controller to control the manual mode and in fact it's kind of retarded we we did that we were doing that for the last few years where the manual code where you're pressing the buttons that ran through the controller well that's a bad idea because if the controller burns out or you know there's a mistake on the controller you can't run your brick press whereas uh, when you separate that first of all the code becomes grossly simplified uh, so right now I, I looked at back at the code and the code was like 70 lines back in 2010 uh, where we just had automatic and then we added the manual controls but we added manual controls through the controller so uh, we bloated to about 400 code lines of code for the controller and now I'm gonna take that back down it's just ridiculous how it is right now so I'm gonna take that down back to like 70 lines or so um, just simplify it because we don't need it it's it's the code for the controller should be very very simple it's like when the just it's basically move the cylinder move the cylinder until pressure goes high if pressure goes high do another motion etc it's a very simple logic and uh, there's a calibration step where we do we basically measure the time that something moves that the, one of the cylinders moves but I, I'm not gonna get into the details here but basically the bottom line is that you need one sensor and 70 lines of code and that sensor is a pressure sensor we used to do position based sensors two position based sensors in fact uh, yeah, two, two position based sensors. You don't need position sensors. It totally works well to do just pressure, pressure sensing. So you know when you're at the limit of a stroke when the pressure that you're sensing went high. That's it. So one sensor, 70 lines of code, two solenoids. Uh, so yeah, we're, we're going to deploy that this weekend, report on that, how that goes. Uh, but yeah, definitely simplifying that. Just like on a power cube, we're simplifying grossly like the um, let's go to the power cube part library um, power cube version 17.08 uh, we're working on a part library right now the goal is to get as many of those parts as possible for a very simple design uh, the conceptual design is here with um, an August 19 design sprint and we've got a master CAD list and let's see how we're doing on that bunch of assignments mastercad checklist is basically what we're doing and i think a good model to follow for the mastercad checklist is the lyman film and extruder where we basically got all the parts in there and and it was great like the completion was marked by the fact that we had the cad file for every single part also a, a sourcing link for every single part 
uh, but here we still need to go with a few few more parts uh, we gotta keep doing that so what I'm gonna do is assign people to that uh, very explicitly on this this meeting so we can continue on that and finish that as we build the power cube this weekend now we we won't have the complete looks like we may not have the complete cat I mean the workshop is this Saturday uh, but we should uh, I mean let's see if, if uh, people can can produce more of these parts uh, and then the part library is down here we've got a bunch of parts I know Ahmed updated some of the the parts we've got the engine by Josh the pump um, more parts more parts but uh, let's see how far we can get done and, and Jose's uh, not Jose but but uh, we've got Roberto working on an instructional for the workflow uh, using assembly workbench of how we put all these parts together so we're still working that out there's some issues apparently but we're, we're getting them resolved uh, how to use a very efficient workflow where once you have all the parts you just put them in readily into the final final CAD document uh, okay so we're continuing on that and as far as the shape for what we're doing this weekend um, let's see let's look at the frame maybe uh, just this is from from Ahmed but frame module we've got uh, I'll just open it up for reference but basically looks like looks like this frame we gotta fit the engine with a pump in it the the fan fits into on the right side the, if we use a 24 inch by 24 inch frame then then yes the the pump will be sticking out of the frame a little bit I think that's acceptable for now that's that's all right um, and we might want to just increase the frame but but if the pump is sticking out but everything else fits I think we'll we'll be okay um, uh, for now and of course the file for the the frame is editable so that just like we see let's look at here so that's the frame uh, as it is so here on this side here is where the mounting of the fan is gonna be on this this right side where you see that the fan cooler assembly goes into those two bolt holes um, so this is the hydraulics wait I have it upside down actually because the hydraulics are gonna be on the right hand side here uh, so the engine goes into this compartment here there's there's gonna be a plate here on a base that mounts the engine so the the engine mounts right to this base plate which is part of the bottom frame and you've got the suction so you're sucking fluid out of the bottom you're returning the fluid there the fluid filter is going to be there and then the frame is going to have to have a filler breather breather cap um, so next step is uh, fit the engine in here I know the engine has been updated quite a bit we got pretty decent dimensions for the engine so we can keep going with that and that's pretty good now when we do the actual build what we'll do is uh, I was thinking about this and it's actually a very lots lots of cutting here oh wait actually here what I'm noticing here Ahmed is uh, if these these holes are, if these are to the right because uh, okay we're looking at it the engine is facing us here the 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 handle of the engine the, the pull start of the engine is facing us here the pump is towards the back if the pump is towards the back that means the suction should be towards the back here too but that means the holes here are on the wrong side they should be up for the fan cooler the fan cooler should be more above rather than below unless it unless it's actually better below we can't really see without fitting it it might be that the hoses fit better when the fan is lower but no I don't think so actually we gotta move the holes up because the hoses are pointing down so you have to make the hoses run down and, and turn uh, so probably these holes need to go up but that's good um, so moving on uh, just some other, other topics um, back to the roadmap critical path here uh, let's see if anyone else got any product for this this uh, week please paste that in we, we were working on this larger two two foot frame that's just one of the other products we did uh, during the work sh uh, aftermath of the workshop but one last thing is uh, so the alignment filament extruder once again that still remains as a high priority item by all means it's very important to get low cost filament from scrap and to do recycling save the earth while you're producing useful parts definite uh, definite good idea now so we're still gonna do that that simple experimental filament maker workshop so so say uh, Saturday would be the 3d printer build on October September 30 and then we do the Sunday would be the filament maker so but for that I got the filament maker we got to do the part sourcing 
we got to 3D print the parts, inventory the parts, just make sure the motors work, and have a day of uh, prototyping that, uh, however much we get done before the workshop. So that's that's coming. Like right now, basically based on the bill of materials, I mean, we're pretty good to essentially get those parts, maybe substitute some from Amazon and eBay for easier sourcing, but we're pretty much ready. That cat is pretty good and complete. So it's actually the filament maker turns out to be one of our more complete um, exhaustive designs with a complete master master list master cad checklist so uh, tractor team uh, just to update on that uh, we've gone through three lessons basic lessons you can go to the uh, tractor construction page 2017 on the wiki so tractor construction set 2017 we've got all the videos you can review them but we're gonna get serious into that um, after the the CEB, but also that does mean finishing up the power cube because the power cube is definitely part of the tractor. But you can review all the meetings from before. But now we're pretty much ready to do, uh, just ready to design design the real thing. And what we can do for the workshop is uh, because we're modular once again, do the 16 16 horsepower and 64 horsepower. I would do both both of those. So we get four power cubes built during the workshop, so it will be a, a three-day workshop, uh, build four power cubes, build the tractor, and then run it on the third day. So that's that's uh, October 30. That's that's what we're looking at. Uh, circuit mail, I gotta check in on the circuit mail, how Shane is doing. We've had some updates before. I wanna make sure that's going forward. Um, let's see, CNC torch, as I mentioned, we, we're going back to the drawing board a little bit, a little bit of redesign of the actual uh, carriage pieces. Well, no, we still could do it, but what we ended up doing with the torch table is using hollow pipe instead of solid pipe because it's much lighter for the gantry. So that's one of the things. We actually used the standard steel pipe. We buffed it so it's smooth and then use that. Okay, so let's see. Let's go right into, let's see. Do we have um, Roberto on a call so we can maybe get an update on the workflow for assembly? Is that, uh, let's see, Roberto, are you on? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. I'd like to share my screen yeah, to please show do. you my... Yep, go ahead. Can you see my screen? Let's see. Um, yeah, 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 okay, there we go. Let's do it. Okay, here I am. In the working document, I put the last steps that I I'm using to to assemble parts, and well, I I'm going to show you now because it's it's uh, very specific, uh -huh. um, and it could it could take some time to get used to this workflow. So the first step is to import all the needed parts using the assembly to workbench here. Uh -huh. With this button, we first import all the parts or the the, av the, the available parts mm -hmm. and till that that moment. Yeah, and which button it's is that? So you're using which button? This button. I don't know if you can see. Where's my mouse? Oh, okay, hold on, hold on, just a second. Let me record that here. Um, it says import a part from another FreeCAD document. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to move my screen down. Oh yeah, okay. Okay, import. So we're using the first button there, import Import apart from another FreeCAD document. So this is an import, not like the import through the file menu. It's a different import. We're in assembly no, two right now. It's, right. it's not. It's, it's not import the import from file a file merge. menu. Right. No, only this button will, will work with this, with this uh, workbench. Yes. Okay, so the first step is that so importing all the all the parts that you you have available uh, yep. at this moment. So next, the second step mm -hmm. is to verify that that there are no parts with the fixed position property set to true. Okay. I mean, if you go to um, any of this this parts, you can see here in the property panel. Uh, an option called fixed position. So this 
this option here has uh -huh. this property has ha, has two options false and true yep so you have to verify that all for for each of the parts of the um, for each of the imported imported parts this option is set to false okay so let's let's I, I'm going to go go down to so you can see that everything is set to false okay it's important because I discovered that when when something is true the start start um, the frequent starts to fail okay so that's the second step the third step is verify that and there not are, even hold on zero L let Sorry? me ask you a question. So, so not even the master part, the first part is the is the fixed position, or you'll set that later. Yeah, when when you start the assembly with the first part, uh, it could be useful to set the, the the fixed position to true, but only for for that part and only when you are assembled those first two parts. Okay. Later, you can you. I mean, you have to set to false all the all the parts in the fixed position property. Okay. So let's let's continue. Then the third step is to verify there are that there are zero degrees of freedom. Uh huh. And to do that, you have a, an option, a tool here called Animate Degrees of Freedom. Okay. So I click this this option. Uh huh. And it shows how many degrees of freedoms we we have. Okay. So I am okay because it has to scroll now. Zero degrees of freedom. Okay, close. Yes. Then I close that and go to the fourth step. And hold on I a second. Let me ask you this: If if yeah. there are some degrees of freedom, how do you get rid of them? Is that very transparent all the time? Uh, yes, I, I can show you an example. Yeah. For example, with the with the fan here. Okay. The fan is fully constrained now, but if I delete some of the some of the constraints. Uh huh. Let's put this for example. Sorry. Okay, this constraint is is um, relating these two faces. Mm hmm. Can you see? Yeah, I think the I'm third the third constraint. Yeah, third plane I'm constraint. Going to, to, sh to, to see that I, with with the right re right click on the constraint. Uh huh. And then go to assembly two option here, and then uh -huh. se select object elements. Okay. Doing that, you can see which faces are constrained with that constraint. Okay. So I'm going to delete this, this constraint, so you can see what happened when I I check the degrees of freedom. Yeah. Okay. Let's. Can you see now? Now I have one degrees of degree of freedom. Yeah. And it yeah. shows where it is, where what uh, what part have that degree of freedom, and we also can animate this with mm -hmm. these options. We have many degrees of freedom. We can animate all, or animate uh -huh. only one selected. Okay. So I'm going to animate this uh, to see what happened. Uh huh. Oh, can you see? Yeah. Yeah. So the, the fan, fan is moving. Start to move, so we can see where is the degrees, the, the degree of freedom that, that we, we we have to to constrain. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to close this. I'm going to add uh, and the, the constraint that I delete. To do that, I'm well. This is part of the the procedure that I, I'm going to to show you that uh, later. But I, I'm going to do this um, um, quickly so mm -hmm. we can continue with the. Um, okay, here. Uh, a paint constraint. Okay. So now. Sorry. 
Okay. Now we can continue with the with the procedure here. So we, we were in the third step, verify that there are zero degrees of degrees of freedom. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's continue with the fourth step. Add a single constraint between one and assembled part, which means without any constraint, and one assembled part, which is which means fully constrained. So for example, in the um, in the file. Here I I, I have a switch. Here. As you can see it it, it has uh, zero constraints, so it's it's fully unassembled. This is an an unassembled part. Part. Do you understand that? Yep. Okay. Now, to assemble this part, I'm going to to use one fully assembled part or fully constrained part, like this part of the case, which is here. And if you you see here, well. Has a lot of, of constraints, but we know that it's fully constrained because when we test with the degrees of freedom tool, we know that all the parts assembled are fully constrained. So the next step is to add one single constraint between these two parts. So, for example, I'm going to constrain this face with this face here going to do a plain constraint with this button. So it uh, um, now we have two new constraints here, one for each part. And the next step the, the next step is to select oh first we have an option in, in the constraints for here in the property panel the offset option. If we want to to move the the, the part, uh, I mean, for example, let me show you the, the power supply here. Can you see the power supply? Yeah, yeah. Okay, this 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 face of the power supply is constrained to to those to that face uh, there. Can you see that? Yeah, yeah, I think so. You're, it's a little. If I go, yep, go ahead. Yeah, if I go to, to that to that constraint um, here, you can see we have the offset option to minus six. That's because it's not exact the um, the, the the plane for the faces. Uh, there there's a little um, a little difference between the planes. Do you understand that? Yeah, yeah. Your your screen is not up. Yeah, your screen is updating a little late, but yeah. Uh huh. Okay. I'm going to to continue then. So, if we in in this case for the for the plane that we we just constrained here, those plane and that plane and 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 that plane, mm -hmm. we we don't need to to set an offset different than than zero. So. We can continue. Also, um, you see the fourth step, the, the five step. You can also lock rotation. This is for circular constraints only. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to, to do a, a, a better instructional video for that. So yeah. Let's let's continue by now. For yeah. now. Yeah. Yep. So the the next step. This is important because. I, <laughs> Took me a, a while to realize about this. Mm -hmm. sex, sex is, the next step is to select the unassembled part and set fixed position property to true. So here the unassembled part was the switch. I'm going to select the switch here and set the false, I mean the fixed position property to true. Now one of the the constraint that we have here we have in the in the tree view goes automatically with when in, in, inside the, the the switch part. So 
so it was moved from here to here. Now uh, the, the next step is do the, the same but setting the, the fixed position property to false. So I'm going to select the, the switch and return the, the fixed position property to false. And now I still have uh, one constraint outside the parts, the assembled parts, so I have to solve that bef uh, before I can continue with assembling other parts. To do that, I'm going to select the unassembled part, I mean the assembled part, and do the same. Set the fixed position property to true, and you see the, 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 the constraint was moved automatically from outside the, the, the parts to inside the the part that, that I changed this this option. So and then to false again. And that's the the fir the, the steps for the first constraint. Okay. Do you do you see that? Yeah. So okay to summarize I kind of missed what you meant by this very important point because it seemed like you were doing the same thing. You're just constraining things fully, correct? I mean, that's all. Yeah, but, but the, the important thing is the order of, of these steps because if you, for example, if if I if I leave, I mean, if I if I leave constraints outside the, the parts, when I keep constraining uh, parts. Uh, the freak out, it starts to to show problems. I mean, mm -hmm. some conflicts between constraints are it, it, it even sometimes freak outs close yeah. un unexpectedly. Yeah. So you're saying that the solution to the what is the key to the proper order? You do the what is that critical point then? Just to summarize, is after. Adding each constraint. But let me do the, uh, one more. One more. For example, this plane with this plane. Here. Yeah, Sorry. it's not. It's not really showing updating your screen and that as as you're speaking now. So we can't really tell oh, what, you're, what you're doing. So maybe save this for the instructional. Yeah, it's it's just a, like a few seconds delay. Like it, it doesn't really show says Roberto's having connectivity issues so maybe maybe save that for the instructional but that's good so uh, I mean the bottom line is that what happens when people don't know how things go together well it depends on a problem that we have if it's the power cube it's make everything fit you know so you, you look at your design problem statement like make all the parts fit in this frame and that's how you know where you can put things and then we might have to shift them around, move them around. So the point is of the CAD is that we shift things around within the CAD so that when we build it, it's actually buildable. That's that's the idea here, right? But um, so you're assuming, you're, Roberto, you're making the assumption that people know where the parts go. That's correct? Yeah, of course. Of course, yeah. Right. And uh, the more interesting question is like, how how do we establish a workflow when say we created a library of parts like the tractor and then people have to figure out how they go together well a lot of times it will be very logical and the point of design of the parts themselves is to make them pretty transparent and then of course to provide design guides where people understand that okay this part fits in such and such so that's the design guide part once you write a design gar guide then people can take take the parts and make various uh, different modifications of them and that's something we would want to do like I was looking at um, so the D3D uh, we can probably say that the 16 inch version is good as it is but for example if we wanted to add a 12 inch bed and get the absolute f full motion out of that we would have to rearrange axes in a little way uh, one thing that I thought about is maybe the next iteration of frame cutting is um, why not make the rods go through tiny holes in the frame so that the rods are located and you don't even need to, the magnetic attachment. 
You know, so that's that's one thing that actually emerged from the latest discoveries. Uh, the carriage printed, like the printed pieces, like say you got a frame, you can put those, the printed pieces actually on the outside of the frame and the and the rods actually sticking through the frame. So, so what I'm saying is that we can play with various modifications of the existing things that we have, as long as we provide design guides of, okay, how, what are the possible or acceptable design patterns? Um, what I just said, said to you would be important for the nested frames, like there's the 16, 13, 11, and nine inch frames. Well, once you get to the smaller frames, it's important, it's critical that you have all the space that you need, and that's where you can do more if you, for example, put those uh, the rods actually through the metal frame. That means you're actually cutting out little holes with CNC in the frame itself. So, so our current frames are not the ones we have left over. Don't have those holes yet, etc. But we will get to uh, refinement of the other versions in the future. So I think uh, on the 3D printer part. We do have the libraries that are pretty pretty complete. I mean, we, we do have to clean it up. And I think what, what will happen is once we master this workflow, absolutely, then we'll go back and clean up all the parts and then pretty much redo all the different designs. Because even, um, well, we don't ha actually have a complete, complete final version of the 13-inch, like as was built. And for the 16-inch, uh, if we wanted to put in a 12-inch bed, then it actually would help if you if you do the the rods through the frame, etc. So so point being that in the name of the construction set, there's so many variations you can make, and that's where the the workflow of assembly would allow us to take all our parts and make reconfigurations happen. So that's good. Well, we look forward to your instructional. That's that's a critical thing that everyone on the team would have to learn, and that would be great. So keep going at it. Please let me see the final. Um, final script so it's like if there's questions to the uninitiated since I haven't worked around with assembly a lot uh, I can ask innocent questions about it yeah so let's move on to the last step and go back to uh, the power cube and roll allocation with that uh, we do know that just to go on slide let me see am I sharing my screen no let me share my screen so if we go to slide number three on a design sprint, uh, raw allocation for, for the Saturday, we had all these people um, pipe in. So I know that Sarah's working on a 3D printer, Saudi Arabia work. Christian is working on an ISO. Uh, Michael's doing server. Emmanuel's doing stuff. Um, Dixon's doing the promo video. Oliver's updating the torch table electronics documentation. Roberto's doing the instructional. Michelle is doing some WebGL documentation. Um, but we've got who are all the people that we have right now available to take on some more roles because we want to continue to nail the power cube, all the part library there. So so let's I'm gonna put Michelle as a candidate, and we have to also add the new people. Uh, see if we can get um, our new people mispronounced German as well as um, and you have to tell us how you say your name because I actually don't know um, and um, we've got Salam and we also have um, a few more people applying so yeah we're con con continuously building the team but this this is not design sprint so we won't have a design sprint since we have a really busy week this weekend three-day workshop uh, so rolls on power cube main goal is finish mastercad master assembly um, yeah as far as the module breakdown it's like we definitely have the frame fan cooler assembly Return line filter, suction line to pump to engine. That's kind of stuff you fit in. It's kind of hard to draw that. Mounting, uh, mounting. I mean, engine mounting is part of the engine. So engine is a module. So engine module, we can say, with um, 
like engine, I would say the pump assembly, and then engine assembly, where engine assembly, I mean, it's really, as we have it right now, it's really like one part, just the main engine itself, plus a couple of bolts, maybe placeholders for a couple of the wires. Um, but let's go let's go to some allocations of effort so uh, I'm gonna go to the power cube uh, actual spreadsheet power cube 17.08 uh, mastercad checklist is the critical document so let's look at exactly who is filled in for for what um, all right mastercad file that's gonna be later uh, I think Josh is pretty good on the engine engine mounting bolts Michelle is um, I think we can say he's progressing on that um, that is good that role is allocated So we can put in under green the ones that are allocated and please continue those as as we get new information like for example on the frame I, I sent a comment to Ahmed about an update um, I mean Ahmed as well I mean you can take to finish up the bottom mounting you can not take the engine as is because that's been corrected and you can start fitting that the, the bolt pattern for the engine mount that's one of the main things um, let's see who's got the pump assembly in this so engine frame fan cooler battery pump assembly we need to allocate some people to to work on that so maybe since um, Josh, you did pretty good on the engine there. So engine assembly, I'm going to put you on that. So the engine assembly includes bolts for mounting, like wire, wire placeholders. Basically, like draw like a little little placeholder color coded for wire, like where you make connections to the battery and to the uh, what else is there? Battery charging. That's it. Wires to battery charging. If we're if we're in this engine, we actually don't have the electric start, so it's just wire for charging the battery. Okay. Frame. I'm gonna put Ahmed on that still. Uh, so the frame bottom mounting piece the engine goes there you already did the bolt holes for the fan You can take a look at the exact spacing from the fan module. And let's see the fan module uh, Who do we have for the actual? Cooler cooler Jose, okay Jose cooler is that coming along there can you continue working on that? Because, um, yeah, that bolt pattern is going to determine the bolt pattern on a frame. Yeah, I, I, I will still work on that. Uh, I have a lot of problem with the matching of the, with the coupling of the, of the parts, you know? Uh, how is that? Like, which, how they fit? Well, yeah, I had, I, I had some problems with... Uh, with uh, parts like for also with the, for instance with the with the fan like you cannot import them as an assembly because uh, they are not all uh, uh, one object and then I have uh, I had to go to what I tried to do was to make this part which need to be quite precise in open scat and then it was really easy to import it and edit what open scad but that's that's mesh you said open scad yeah but then you can import it in, in frigate as, as a as a frigate file frigate has a as an interface with open scad and, and it turns it into a frigate uh, file with the oh and the, 
Oh, now that's very interesting. Yeah, I didn't know that. Okay, that's uh, we need to document that. Um, do, can you do uh, a, a one a, yeah. a simple screen capture of that? Because um, that that that's great. That's, yeah, that's a great feature. The parts are fully parametric. Yeah. Which is something that it's not easy huh. to do in FreeCAD, but in OpenSCAD, it's, it's, uh, I, 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 it has some learning curve, but one day I learn it. Huh. So it, it's not bad for simple parts. But, well, if uh, dude, I have, I yeah. have a problem with the coupling of female, male, and stuff like that. So yeah. I, I was studying yeah okay well if you got this little trick on on open scat i mean open scat is uh good to get into because a lot of stuff a lot of design files exist in open scat like for example the sprocket for the tractor that i did in open scat so it is useful to learn it so what i would like to ask you um since we're all about developing techniques developing collaborative workflows uh after you're done with these please document that process uh, so you're saying that it gets you to a native FreeCAD file, is that so? Uh, what what you do is that you import the uh, because uh, OpenSCAD works also with objects as well, so in the same logic. And uh, basically, what you do in OpenSCAD is what FreeCAD does in the, in, the, in the back of the scene. So it's exactly the same kind of workflow as you're working with FreeCAD, but you can see the code. No. Work right. Like that. So if you make if you make a composition of two cylinders and then you make a hole uh, and you import it in FreeCAD, all those steps are imported in FreeCAD as well. Oh really? That's that's really good. And we don't get into the issue that that is a mesh file. It's actually a FreeCAD file. It's a yeah. It's code. Uh, uh, and what actually FreeCAD does is it reads that code and then it imports it with the same type of uh, logic of object uh, construction, you know? Right, but does it treat it like, can we do all the other things in our workflow with that, or is that a mesh file? No, it's not a mesh file. It's, okay. Uh, it's, a, it's like, a, it's an object tr tree. Okay, excellent. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's get that going. So, yeah, please continue. I mean, uh, shoot me some specific questions. I, I think I tried to answer some of them, but just just shoot me some questions. It's uh, I mean you had it largely correct what I saw last time, so you should yeah. probably yeah. But those were really I, yeah I saw okay so those are uh, I will check again the the, I, the ISO standards and I will yes if I have a doubt I will send you, you know, yeah. Right. So if I open up your file here, for example, with the cooler, uh, the yeah, the, the hydraulic cooler, that's where Ahmed can say, oh, I got the cooler bolt pattern. Now I can, so you see that. I mean, the bolt pattern for the cooler, I mean, the cooler is very simple. The bolt pattern is simply the spacing between, I guess, for Ahmed's use here, the bolt pattern is the spacing between that hole there and the other hole here. Because that's where the rubber mounting piece goes in. Uh, that space there. So if we measure that, um, what is that? About 12 inches. Um, oh, I don't know what happened there. You, I've got a 1.51 inches. That's the scale is off there. Uh, Jose, uh, why am I getting like one? Are you sure this is the file, the, the right file? Well, I just downloaded it right now. Okay. PC twenty forty cooler. I'm I'm reading. Is that correct? I mean, let's see another measurement. Uh, yeah. That, that is that is eighteen inches. But uh, I changed that file. Or I had problem with the with the sizes, and I changed the files. All the files. Uh, yeah. But okay. Big. Well, I downloaded the uh, last one here. And that's too small. That wouldn't get us yeah. the cooling we need. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, so yeah. please please fix that and shoot me specific questions if you have any. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's see. So, so you're also doing the fans, so Michelle is unemployed? Because that was Michelle's work. Uh, I don't know. 
Wait, what did you say that you're doing in OpenSCAD? Uh, I told you that the fan, I would do it in OpenSCAD. Uh huh. Because, you uh, will do that, okay. In uh, just Freecast, it's, it's not, you cannot import it as a, as a, in the assembly because it's not a closed object. So Freecast says you have to, you, have, you need to have only one visible object to, in order to import it to an assembly. Right. And of course, there's other ways to do that. Like you can make it into a sim sim single object too. Are you talking about the fan that was drawn up before? Sorry. Which fan are you talking about that you're referring to? The fan uh, that you have in the part library. Okay. Yeah, but that fan is too big too. That that's uh, that was like. Yeah. Eighteen inches or so. Like any case, or twenty-four. Want... Yeah. I was not able to use it in an assembly. Right, right. Regardless of the, of the size that it has. Right. Yeah, so for clarity, like for example, if we go to the, you know, uh, just to coordinate, because there's different things going on. Like last time we, we generated a 24 inch fan, we can keep that for larger. Well, I don't know if there's 24 inch fans out there, but, but keep that. And. In the part library, we can simply, so say there's the fan right here, clicking on that, it's got one file, just please upload over that, wait, but that's, okay, that says 12 inch diameter, and I made a note there, initial upload was 23 inches, we need 12 inches, so, uh, Margin? yeah, go ahead. Uh, you can you can open the master cut file, I uploaded it. Uh, the file with all the available parts. Uh -huh. I imported all the parts there. Maybe you can see. It. You can see it in. Uh huh. Okay. Let's see that. Ah, uh, you think the fan is the right size there? If it takes up the whole side, it's too big because that fan. Yeah, that fan takes up the whole side. Uh, that fan is uh, 24 inches. The ones that, I'm not sure if they make, uh, probably do make 24 inches, but the one we were uh, wanting is the 12 inches because that's way too big for that little cooler. I mean, we don't need that fan for that little cooler because it would take too much power. But this is good. Um, it's pretty good. So, actually, yeah, if the engine is sitting with a shaft going to the back, this should be, like, actually upside down, maybe. Like the cooler should be on the back side because if we have the engine, yeah, just like the engine is here. Well, the engine is upside down, but the engine should be front face here and the filter should be on the back side because the pump's going to be on the back side. So you put the engine wherever the, the, closer to the pump. Well, the, the, sh the shaft side of the engine will have the hydraulic pump. So therefore, you need to put the cooler, like the return hosing, on that same side. So it'll be. Does that make sense, Roberto? Since you're doing that, that's good. I'm gonna put you on that that task there. So, uh, if you get to yeah, I I need uh, more more details about about the, the assembly. Yeah, um, I'll do that. I'll um, try to provide that. Let's see the. Basically, what we need is an orientation slide and a basic fit slide, uh, which I guess. I put a, a suggestion in the a question uh -huh. in the in the meeting document. Maybe yeah, it's about the uh, using hand drawings, like Ahmed did in the last tractor meeting. Right. Yeah, definitely. I mean, sure. That's a quick one. I could do that. Um, could do that right now. I'll do that. Um, and then Jose says all the relevant things. I mean, there is a lot of relevant things. There's like a whole history we got that you kind of have to follow. But in principle, you go to okay, like take D3D. Well, the ultimate part is I think the D3D part library is where we should have a master CAD file 
there's a step in the overall development process which is like review like product review this goes back Jose what you're asking goes back to the template and to doing all the steps in the development template just to go back um, to the development template this is something we kinda um, we're supposed to do this 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 whole template we should have for every project like for example D3D we should have a wiki page that is one item of the development template like for example the review of how it worked data build pictures build, build video build data collection performance data collection review bug tracker that's all in there in theory those all exist they don't uh, but we should have a page on the wiki that says D3D review uh, D3D bug tracker so that's just just tons of gaps because I mean it's too much work so we were focusing here on the you know the BOM the CAD like the initial des design parts build of materials build parts data we gotta put it put it in there so spend some time uh, documenting this stuff um, ultimate thing would be that we're so all of us are so savvy that we have a placeholder for data collection like we have a placeholder for one of these one of these things the development template that should be up for every project we really don't have that and we should add that and because this whole method is so overwhelming to people we don't have that yet and that's where the process manager slash like um like what kind of what joseph is trying to do a little bit in terms of stewarding stewarding the team a little bit like getting keeping people on track that's where a person like this process manager would say okay now here's our table uh, spreadsheet of all the work product and then a burn down has to be attached to that so it's all there but we're getting there we're gonna get there like right now we're really you know like we're kinda struggling with this 3d CAD and just getting the the CAD to work right um, so I think slowly but surely we're getting there we're building a team and we're building capacity but in principle the the super performing team would be where like jose you mentioned oh where's all this stuff it's not there then immediately you say okay well where is the data collection build review where is it and if you don't see it if you don't see a d3d review then you start that page and you, you put it in and, and mark it in the spreadsheet so so once all of us get savvy on all of that then more of us can fill in that those d different steps right now it's like uh, I'm kind of like have the overview but more people need to catch on that for this to ever scale beyond beyond the knowledge I have in my head right so uh, we just got to keep going at it and, and keep formalizing these procedures until we get a proper burn down but the thing that I've noticed over the history of the project is that yeah I mean I've seeded plenty of these development spreadsheets but they would all remain unfilled so I give I give up well, the solution to that is you have to have enough people on a team to actually meaningfully put those different steps in there. Otherwise, we try to document that as best we can on a main D3D development page. You know, like we do have a D3D page that exists, uh, but it's really like you know someone really needs to manage that page. So D, you know, take a look at D3D. You know, we've got some assets there, but you know. Um, many parts are missing right so there's a bunch of assets on that page but uh, it needs like every page is should be updated and managed actively constantly updated and of course that's not happening we only have so many people on a team people have only so much time so that's where we are that's a little aside on where we're at um, but to continue on a, on a role division here on this uh, let's continue so uh, I want to add some more people to the table here so I'm gonna add German and Salam to that table so what are the things that are missing um, Israel's missing that let's see so I'm gonna say um, Let's maybe assign you to some of these items here. If ones that are unfilled, expanded steel. 
Uh, that should be straightforward from the work document. So look up what expanded steel is. Uh, hose clamps should go in there. The hose, I mean, I don't know how we're going to do the hose, but someone's got to tackle it. Who is anyone feeling like they could handle the actual hose once we, um, once we have the drawing? How do we do hose, which is a complex three-dimensional shape? Um, I, I really don't know at this point, but it's something that a person like Michelle could figure out by importing from Blender. That's what I'm, I'm going to say. So I'm going to put Michelle by the hose. Um, filler breather. That's a simple one. Let's get Salam on that. Draw it up, please. One inch hose barb. Um, that we need done. That's a simple one. We have a three quarter inch one already. Um, we can work from scaling that up. So, for example, one inch hose barb you see in a in a part library between like you have to orient yourself between the part library so if we go to the part library right here you see this for example this hose barb right here and there's a uh, there's a comment there this is three quarter it needs to be one inch so uh, I put a note there. Initial upload is three-quarter barb. We need one-inch barb for 17.08. I don't think we're really ever going to use three-quarter. That's too small for a lot of the applications. Well, it, it works for s smaller engines, but so this needs to be updated. That's the that's the one here. Uh, continuing. So uh, I'm going to put more more names down. We got um, IO. Let's see where IO is on pump mount. Um, let's see the fan cooler. Why is that? Fan? Well, that's the finished module. Um, fan cooler. The dependency there is having the fan and cooler. So, um, but we got to put somebody to it. So after. I mean, I'll put Jose on it after you're done with that. I mean, Jose and... But you got to finish that other part. The battery could be done right now. Who's doing battery? Battery bolts, battery wires. So that's that's happening there. I'm going to put German on that once that's done. I'm just putting people on. Whoever comes, to, comes in. Will. I mean, Will's... Uh, Where's Will on this? He's not here. He needs to be here. So, uh, Will, three-quarter inch quick coupler male. It looks like Jose is doing that. So, Jose, if um, you got all those, I don't see your name there, but so Will's going to go there. Um, let's do that. One-inch hose barb. I'm going to put Will in there again. Okay. Next, we got Ahmed, we got Ayo, we got Josh, Alejandro, Abe, Abe. So Alejandro and Abe, let's see what they're doing. Now, Abe, why am I, where am I seeing you here? Box of the pump. Um, Abe, I'm going to put you on a pump assembly here too, once you're done with that. And Alejandro, I'm going to put Alejandro on this. Right there. Now, three quarter return line filter. So I think that's done. So, so that was Israel. Okay, so Israel did that. That's good. I made a little update to it. So that's in there. Yeah, we got all these parts. We need only one of those pumps, uh, either this, not the small. I think we need the larger one there. That's the log splitter one. The log splitter pump. Question. Yep. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, sorry. Uh, 
some there's something wrong with the with the workflow the actual with the current wor workflow in the in the master split sheet uh -huh. because you have an, at the last um, at the final part you have some assemblies for the yeah. power cube right yeah yeah but the problem is that the problem is that those assemblies cannot be um, imported into into the master cad using the import tool of assembly to workbench because they're not single objects yeah right so it ha it has no sense to to make assemblies mm -hmm. outside the master cad okay okay so so, so how do we do it work on that it's better the better the better option I, I think is that after in, when you when, when every anyone w wants to, to to make an assembly just um, download the master cut import all the all, all the parts to assemble and then assemble mm -hmm. the parts inside the master cut okay so you assemble and, them in a mass then, okay sorry. okay go ahead and then uh, upload upload the master card when the assembly assembly is done. Okay, so you're saying don't put them together by themselves. Put them together as they're gonna fit in on the final product, right? Sorry, can you repeat? Yeah, what I'm saying is that you assemble them within a s assembly module within the master CAD in their final place, not. Like for example, you don't make the pump mount and then put it on the engine. You put it where it's supposed to be to begin with, right? No. 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 I, I, what I say is is that um, because I, I see in the chat box that Jose, for example, yeah. was trying to 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 merge or to import their assembly assembly for the cooler and the fan yeah. into the master cut, but that's that's not possible using the import tool in assembly to workbench. Okay. So for 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 that for those cases I I I'm saying that if you if you if you download the mastercard you can assemb you can do your assembly um together with the main assemb with, with the main frame for example or for with the with the assembled parts or you can assembly assemble your parts uh, separated, but uh -huh. in both cases you are inside. You are you oh, okay. Are okay. Okay. Inside the the master cut file. Okay. Thank you for clarifying that. So, so the re redefinition of assemblies means that when you are making those assemblies, you're downloading the master. Okay, that's very important. Yeah, make sure we cover that very clearly in um, in your instructional video because that's okay. That, that I think that clarifies a bunch of a uh, bunch of things uh, for us. So you can assemble them as separate units within the final CAD, or you can assemble actually in the correct location in the master CAD. If you do it separately, for example, then at the end you just match it up as the next constraint right like you just add another constraint and that makes it go into the proper place is that correct yeah but yeah it's correct but at, at this moment we we still have not um, a good instructional for doing this procedure so mm -hmm. at this moment it, it's m maybe the, the better option the, the best option is only assemble each module inside the master cut and and do not put the modules together okay okay uh do that until we hear more from you on the master instructional I'd, I'd say that that's good so the people here outlined here please uh work within the master cat assembly because roberto said so and he knows freecad better than i on the assembly workbench Okay, sounds good to me. Um, excellent. So let's see if we got uh, some miss some people are missing through the cracks here. Let's see, Joseph and Antonio. Uh, yeah, engine Lovejoy shaft coupler. 
I'm going to put, um, what is this one here that's in there? We got Antonio. Martin. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, w one last thing uh -huh. is that if, if if someone cannot do the, the assembly inside the MasterCAD, yeah. uh, just just uh, leave the parts inside and, and save the, the, the file. Save Maybe the MasterCAD, yeah. Later, someone else is going to do the, the assembly. Right, so you're saying save that within the MasterCAD, yeah? Yeah. Okay. Now I got a question on line number 25. What's going on there? Is that, um, can I erase 25? Uh, no, it's just that I, a, a title for the the parts uh, below. Okay. Because that, that those parts were, were not into the bill of materials. Okay. Um, uh huh. Yeah, they're within. Some of them are within the. Like the pump mount is within the lock splitter pump, and the coupler is also within the lock splitter pump. So they're in there implicitly. All right, so let's see. Are we missing anyone else? Michel, Man, Salam. Okay. You've got a bunch of people lined up for all these different things so I'd like to see everybody uh, complete their so so please refer to this MasterCAD uh, all these spots should be plugged up with real files and then um, for this uh, the link is really the MasterCAD file so but people need to be as um, people need to do that and how do we know when everything is done Um, the condition of satisfaction is we once you do all that CAD you assemble it or import I'm going to add another column which is insert column right one is simply import into master CAD so without even constraining so import it so that will be a step like as soon as you have something why not import it now, okay, let me ask you this uh, once again, Roberto. So say uh, someone does a first draft and they import it into the master CAD. Is that doable? Uh, because, yeah. because let me just uh, continue on that just a little bit. Because then say, say it gets a sent, like further constrained within the master CAD and what if it changes significantly? Those all those changes should propagate properly within the master CAD. Is that correct? Sorry, can you, can you repeat, please? Yeah, right. If if a person puts in an early version of a file, because because that's what I'm trying to encourage, is that as soon as you have anything, it's a placeholder. Use it. Put it in the master CAD. Like for example, for the engine, we could just have could just have a cube with the correct dimensions as the very first cut which would still allow us to start doing some design. So, say you put an early version of something, and then say somebody else constrains it within a master CAD, and then a, another, then the import file, the source file is updated, another document and re-imported. Once you re-import it, it'll change and get constrained as needed, correct? Like everything, like all the operations on that since the master CAD file was updated will be propagated onto that newly imported part. Is that correct? Sorry, your audio mm. is intermittent. But okay. If I understand, if I understand good, what you're asking is if someone assemble a part into the master CAD and then the part has little changes and how how the part is updated into the assembly of the master cut yeah right. yeah yeah so the the workflow for that scenario is that um the the the, the person that is going to update the part ha, ha, have to uh, has to download uh, two files the master cut and the the 
the part that is going to be updated. Do you understand that? Yeah, yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. So having uh, those two files, uh, the, the person just open the MasterCAD and go to the Assembly to Workbench and then right click on the part that he is going to update and then select the Assembly to option and then the, the Edit option. And sorry, edit. sorry, the first step is to update is to update the source file path. Sorry, I, I, I for, forgot the, those important that important step. So again, you first down, download the, the two files, or maybe you have already one of those those files into your your computer. So the point is that you have two files: the the MasterCAD and the part and the updated part file. Okay. So you open the MasterCAD and update into the assembly two workbench. Go to, you go to the part that you want to update, and the first step is to update the source file path into the properties in, into the property panel in the in FreeCAD. Yeah. So you you update the, the the source file path to the the part that you want to that, that is already updated. You save that change, and then you you click on the update imported parts into the assembly to workbench option is next to the import part option okay mm -hmm. doing that the, the part is automatically updated and you you don't you you not have you, you haven't to to constrain again nothing anything I mean. that's good and this is going to be covered in your instructional right of course, yeah. I, yeah. I, I did. I, I I already did some videos showing this. Okay. The, I mean, there's there's a lot of features and and things that you can do there, but yeah, I'm, I'm going to include for sure that that one. Okay. Well, that sounds that sounds good. That's good. Okay. Uh, let's see. Okay. So people then. Um, then everybody please take a look at the PowerCube MasterCAD checklist and to find it you go to PowerCube version 17.08 uh, so I'm going to be wrapping up here PowerCube version 17.08 there's the MasterCAD checklist take a look at what's there um, so there's the BOM, but we have got the MasterCAD checklist for who is doing every single part. So, so has everyone agreed to it, to the um, the different assignments there? Because because we're going to ask you for that that next week. Like this is pretty much complete, and we're we've got this documentation. While we're building it right now, we need to document what we're what we're doing. So this this definitely needs to get done. And depending on the state of completion will be next week we'll be wrapping up the power cube and then getting full time on the tractor so and the power cube of course is part of the tractor so we can make some updates to the power cube and hopefully by then we have the new workflow that if we want to make the power cube for the next tractor which is going to have some updates like it will have multiple suction hoses suction lines because we're going to have four four engines um, we can make those updates readily according to Roberto's procedure that's going to be documented so um, in this in this table then in the spreadsheet uh, just let us know if you have any questions like if you've got any questions on what what's required there or you know like required details it's one of the columns there uh, please ask and we can answer that so all the parts go into the final document and what I'll do is I'll do a quick drawing of the the whole hand sketch of the whole thing uh, for everybody's reference I'll just upload to that like right now as we finish and I'll send that on to everybody. So with that, I think we can wrap up. And uh, so we'll talk again then next week on Tuesday at 1 p.m. Sorry about yesterday, actually. Um, what, what? Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, wa I wanted to add, um, I was working on the ESO. Yeah. And I was um, getting at some point. And there are several questions that I have that they are pretty simple. And I think it's it's better if I ask and move to, to crowd around so maybe they can throw something in. Um, for one, I found a pretty good software um, 
that's able to um, input uh, a custom um, desktop environment. So if there are any wishes, Martian, do you know what a desktop environment is in Linux? Um, yeah, but do we want to go to different desktop environments so that things look different on different people's screens? Or? Yeah, uh, a, a universal, of course. So so there's one okay. for, for everyone. And we could, yeah. for example, Unity is kind of um, special in its own way. And uh, for example, XKDE or LXDE uh, would be far more um, resource. Um, uh, wouldn't take that much of resources. And we are trying, I think, to, to get the, the thing to run on as many computers as possible. So maybe this would be worth a thought. Uh -huh. I'm not sure because it's it's not that much of a deal, but um, if we are saying to we want to reach as many people as possible, this may be uh, something to think about. Well, I would say um, probably without seeing how it works, like we can't, I don't think we we can provide any input unless, I think probably just do the one you think that's the best. Unless some other people have the have a better idea, because I mean, it's got to be lean. It's got to work. Um, but I think eventually it'll be like the adoption of how people like like it. If maybe like if right. if you want to change the different desktop environment, maybe do that in the first release, and then when in the next update we can try another one or something. All right, then then I'll do the job right at. Um, Okay, yeah. and the other thing is, um, I've actually come now to a, uh, did come to a point where I can modify everything. Uh, I found out how, how to do that. Um, I just did that today, and I want to ask: um, This is best done by somebody who is uh, using the settings on his own. So, Martian, maybe you could provide, or anybody else uh, could take the ISO. ISO, ISO? Never mind. Uh, could take the, the, the farm drive and uh, set up the environment in a way that is perfect and then share uh, its, uh, his, his user kind of or the folders that are inside his user um, so I can integrate them and make them default for every uh, uh -huh. um, farm drive to come. Uh -huh. and understand what I mean? So um, right. settings are saved inside your user and I can uh, extract that if you, if you send it to me I, I can put that into the default uh, user setup so this settings folder is kind of um, imported into every new created user okay here's what I would suggest I would suggest that uh, the first step would be produce whatever and then every one of us downloads it and tests it and then we give you feedback on what the right like we can go through all the different settings for each software and we could have people comment on okay this is the best setting and setup for everything that should go into our public document so the document that we have so so we're talking about the OSE Linux here um, so let's go to that page. There's a there's a document there that lists all the software. So we should simply add to that spreadsheet some of those desired settings as a comment. Like, okay, so the big spreadsheet. Where is that? Right right here. Software list on the OSC Linux page shows all our software. Chris, you think we can um like in the notes? I mean notes. We can put yeah, extensive yeah, we notes can, we in can there. Yeah, we add this at the end, right? So yeah. I'll, I'll do what what there what the, what there is already, of course. But um, yeah, it's it's not that much, and I think as we are able to do that, for example, um, putting a free card um, link onto the desktop, for example, mm -hmm. would be a very simple way to improve uh, the entire workflow, <laughs> or um, maybe a yeah. screensaver that looks a bit more custom to to our project. And so mm -hmm. on and so forth, we can do everything. Yeah, I think... So, this may be interesting for the future. Yeah, well, I think the number one thing first is... So, so the idea is, and just to follow up on Christian's work here, so we're producing a new version of OSC Linux that has all the software. Like, for example, right now we're getting into conflicts like between 
FreeCAD versions. So if we download the official Linux, we can know exactly where we are and what software so that results across different different programs could be absolutely identical. Like for example, in the language agnostic instructionals, extraction of, of uh, isometric views, my views look different than Roberto's. Like my lines were like thick. Why? We have to like reconcile all of that so that we get cons consistent results throughout the whole ecosystem of us using it. So first step is to everybody download and test it and then we can talk about okay let's let's talk about customizations and an optimal setup of that but it would be good that everyone downloads it and actually tests it so this is going to be ready pretty soon so we definitely want to have everybody just really nail this out um, for cases like even for OSC workshops people just also download the Linux and they have their Cura and 3D printing software or even the brick control software etc right there um, so that's that's the idea but we got to test it within a team first so first thing is to roll it out and us first step is does it work for all of us like all of us should be able to go through a turnkey process where you hit download make make the disk and it works so I think there's gonna be probably gonna be issues with just resolving that first step so I think I think we got to take it step by step yeah I'm pretty confident that will work um... I'm having a little problem here because uh, the, 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 the PC that I've been working on is uh, dying. <laughs> yeah. And uh, um, that, that means I, I cannot test it that well, but I've, I've put it into a virtual box and it's definitely loading. I just don't have internet in that virtual box and I, I can't get it to work. And that means that I can't test the Chromium um, with its Jitsi add-on. I can't test whether it downloads the Jitsi because it's getting no internet. Um, it's a bit of a problem, but it's definitely working, but the principle is working, and I'm very confident that I can... I have a version uh, up right now, so we can use that one. It's just missing the uh, the part that I, I just described with the the customization okay. but as we're trying that uh, on our own um, it may be of interest to just try that okay. um, I could doc document how that looks right now and we could start testing it right now okay. because it has two I'd say two issues and one untested one uh, I can I can just write down the issues and how to resolve them because it's only a thing of a few seconds um, and with the first uh, set, uh, with the first setting we import. So with the first feedback, I can resolve these uh, these problems together with the um, with the called okay. um, fixes. Okay. Well, the next step is for you to send us send the whole team the download link and instructions how to do that. Or I mean, best put them on a wiki, wiki of course. I'll and, do that yeah, on the wiki update. right tomorrow. Yep. And then we can start testing the new OSC Linux, and that that'll be great for getting everybody on the same page. Because I know, I mean, already it's kind of frustrating with FreeCAD. You know, just a little example with not being able to re repeat Roberto's result in one of the specific things in language agnostic instructionals, or for example, like my explosions always crashing. That would resolve whether it's my computer or whether it's different versions or what. So so this will definitely help everybody learn faster so thanks and we'll uh, look forward to your publication yeah okay perfect all right so uh, you'll you'll kind of uh, spread the word when, when I put it onto the wiki page no so, you're gonna write so, an email to the whole group you're included in a, on an email thread correct uh, yeah yeah oh all yeah, right yeah, yeah, yeah do I'll that. do that okay uh -huh. let okay. everybody know where it's at and the instructions and we go from there all right okay yeah. excellent Thank you. So I think, yeah, we want to wrap up here. Um, so everybody just, um, for everybody watching this right now and the recorded version, the role assignment is for Sirius. If, uh, if you don't do it after, for next week, uh, Joseph's going to come after you. So that's the threat of punishment. Okay, well, thanks everybody for doing this. So we're, we're going to have an exciting weekend uh, this week building the next iteration of the brick press and power cube much simplified versions with much simplified code so we really look forward to that and getting a machine 
that's going to go out to Utah, to the University of Utah. Utah, They have a sustainable building program there that they're building houses on Native American reservations and so forth. So that's going to be, uh, the brick press is going to be going out into the field uh, pretty soon for them. But yeah, thank you. And continue on a power cube, please. And then next meeting on Tuesday, 1 p.m. next time. And we'll finish up the power cube and get more into the tractor. So thanks a lot. Take care.